So we got to do a Nerd Files episode on ski stability. Ski stability is the single most requested characteristic for skate skis. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the stability and ski ability of skate skis. I'm going to try to simplify the fact that there's not a simple answer by trying to categorize different types of stability, what factors contribute to them, but also highlight the individual part of this whole thing, the way that you stand on the ski being really critical to the performance and ski ability of the platform that you're on. Okay, one big subject that is a little bit more absolute than it is personal is edge security or edge stability, the, the ability of the edge to bite in and hold the snow. This is kind of a big deal when it's a big deal. 2023 Biathlon World Cup in Le Grand Bornam was the most recent egregious example. There have been a lot of them over time, domestically and internationally, but that one was on TV. And it was a, kind of a big deal because Fisher athletes just got absolutely smeared specifically by Solomon skiers, although there were Matsu skiers and Razi skiers who also did comparatively very well. Really, the main news of the day was that Fisher athletes did very poorly. And it was presumed that it was because of the edges of their skis. The course had been groomed super poorly. It was freeze thaw, so it was super soupy, really wet. They groomed in the heat of the day. It froze up, locked up super hard. Maybe they salted, I don't know the specifics, but it was glare ice, really hard to get an edge in. And the Fisher skis just weren't providing sufficient edge security. I don't think this has anything to do with the shape of the edge. Fisher notably has a square edge. They have since they introduced the Speedmax model. We started testing that ski at the 2010 Olympics. So it's been around a long time and the edge security didn't really change that much between the previous edge shape, which had a little lip on it and the square edged uh, shape. I don't think that the specific shape of the edge makes that big a difference, but there are differences in the shapes of the edges. My personal feeling is that when the ski is being loaded on edge, the forces are going kind of perpendicular to the base here. And the presence of sidewall proximal to the edge doesn't make that big a difference because there's not a lot of force in that direction. So that, that's, that's my theory, but there are plenty of other factors to consider when we talk about edge stability. So part of this has to do with the conditions that we're talking about. If the conditions are really hard, impenetrably hard, then the biggest consideration is getting really long edge contact area. It's basically a contact patch thing. If we reduce the local force then and spread out the load over a long area, then there's less chance of, of the edge breaking away. But when the snow is plastic when it can deform a little bit under edge, then you want really high pressure. And in those conditions, higher local edge contact area is going to give you more bite or more purchase. So depending on conditions, you might want short contact area with high local pressure, or you'll want really diffuse long area with really low local pressure for in impenetrable conditions. So it, it's not even really absolute in terms of the camber and fit characteristics of the ski, what's gonna work best. And in fact, with all fit characteristics, we don't see that big a change from one to the next in general in terms of edge security. Typically, a Matsu ski has a Matsu feeling edge and a Fisher ski has a Fisher feeling edge, regardless of if it's really stiff or if it's softer, if it's a short edge contact area or a long edge contact area. This, I think, has a lot more to do with the material in the ski and its stiffness and its torsional rigidity. I did a bunch of measurements and it's pretty interesting. While we look at skis as being roughly comparable, all brands make great skis, no one's really way ahead of everyone else, they all work, there are really big differences out there. If we look at the front of the skis, the Solomon skis, which are notable and reputed to have super good edges, have very soft forebody material. Compared to the other brands, they have the thinnest material section and they're, let's see, I took some measurements. They're over twice as prone to deformation as the Rossignols. So if we take the same section of ski measured from 40 centimeters to 70 centimeters in front of the balance point, and we just deform that area, the Rossi deflects less than half as much as the Solomon. So it's kind of interesting 
both are really edgy skis, but they're very, very different in terms of stiffness. What they're not that different in terms of is torsional rigidity. So although the Solomon ski has the softest material stiffness longitudinally, it has among the highest torsional rigidity measurements comparable to, to the Rossignol. The Mazus and the Fisher are about 40% softer torsionally in that part of the ski. We also have to look at the rear body of the ski and that's where to balance out a very soft front end, Solomon has the stiffest rear of the ski measured from 20 to 50 centimeters behind the balance point. This area is much, much thicker. It's also torsionally rigid. All of the skis are a lot closer in the rear body measurements but we do see differences. The Matsus are softer, where they have quite stiff front end materials. They have the softest rear end materials of the whole lineup and the lowest torsional rigidity in the rear. They track very well and they're pretty edgy. It's all about balance, stance on the ski, and what the load distribution is. Solomon is designed to carry most of the load in the rear of the ski and a relatively light amount in the front of the ski. When you mount a Solomon way far forward or get way up in front of your foot on the ski, the ski's nowhere near as stable. It really does best with most of the load carried on the rear of the ski, and you can see that in the material. Matsus, on the other hand, loves to be skied forward. They do really, really well when you're up and forward on the skis, and this is reflected by the relative balance and sharing of the load fore aft with quite high torsional rigidity and stiffness up front and a balanced amount in the rear. Okay, directional stability, that's the next category we need to talk about, where edge security is super important when it's super important, like at Le Grand Bournon. Normally, getting the edge in isn't the biggest deal in the world. Directional stability is a much bigger issue when it comes to the ski ability of the ski. And this is where things start to become more personal. There are much more contributions from fit factors and camber when it comes to directional stability. In general, a longer wheelbase will give you a wider stance on the snow and more directional stability because of that wide stance. It's kind of like, you know, <laughs> getting stable like this as opposed to being perched in close. On the other hand, when you're way out wide on the ski, you're standing on much thinner material and you have less longitudinal stiffness in the material and torsional stiffness in the material and therefore you can sometimes not get as much super, uh, material support from the ski and if the camber is really high you can feel like you're kind of up on stilts. So even though you have good directional tracking stability the ski ability can come down quite a lot. It's a harder ski to handle if it's super high camber. Another factor when it comes to directional stability I'll use the Solomon again as an example, is the length of the contact area and the load distribution. It's got a subtle positive camber through the whole rear body, and that bend toward the base means that under pressure, the ski is going to compress to flat, carry a little tension, and push load further back. This creates what I call a bit of a rudder effect. Solomon seems to have found a really fast solution with a moderate, what I would call, rudder although in the most recent production they're testing some much shorter contact areas and it'll be interesting to see how that affects the ski ability and directional stability of the ski. This is also where fore aft loading makes a big difference. If you ski a Matsu ski in a relatively forward position where you're closer to that 50-50 load distribution, it carries more load on the front of the ski, you get a lot of directional stability from the balance of the material, that wheelbase length comes to your aid. Whereas if you take Matsu ski that has a little bit of tail release and not the longest rear end pressure, and you stand back at the rear, you kind of pivot over that rear pressure point because you don't have enough up front to lend the directional stability from the forebody of the ski. And that's kind of the opposite of the Solomon. If you start to put the load up front where the material is very, very soft, it just doesn't contribute nearly as much as what you're taking away from the rear of the ski. We also have to consider the base of the ski, the groove configuration, for example. Rossignol has for decades had two grooves, and that does provide really good flat ski stability. This isn't a factor that I look for. I tend to try to get on the edge early and utilize the security of the edge for stability, at least get pressure on it. I don't spend a lot of time floating on a dead flat base, but these two grooves provide additional control surfaces. Interesting to note that Testing from Matsus really showed that 
that extra groove surface area, that control surface also costs some speed in many conditions, which is why they removed the front end of the groove from their F3 ski. Many people feel that F3 ski is nowhere close to stable enough. I have a really easy time skiing on that. We can change it a little bit with grind patterns. It's interesting that more pattern provides more stability, especially when there's a linear component to it. Super fine grinds can be really squirrely. A lot of people struggle in cold conditions, particularly when it's compact, because the grind contributes so little to the stability of the ski. We have done grinds, especially for people, that include milled channels from the grinder underneath the finished structure to provide more control surfaces in order to provide additional directional stability. This is really where we get into the concept of skiability and handling characteristics. Skiability is your ability to handle the ski. While stability, edge security and directional stability sound like fantastic qualities that you just can't have too much of, I think there is such a thing as too much. Last year at the start of the season, we went up to Foray Montmorency. They did a great job grooming with what they had, but snow was low, conditions were terrible, there was a ton of traffic on it, and stability was really difficult, and it was grabby, punchy, packy, plasticky snow. And I was testing these Rossies for the first time, which are dramatically directionally stable. They also have really, really sharp edges, and I found it scary to go downhill on these things. Amy was laughing at me and making fun of me because I was chickening out. Like I, I was, I was like, like literally going like this, kind of like reverse skating down hills because I didn't feel like I could snowplow. I couldn't skid the ski without pitching over the edge. It felt really unpredictable and it made me super aware of my knee injury, which typically I just ignore. And, and, and just go on. And the next day in the same conditions, I went on shorter, softer, much lower skis, some 183s that Amy had been testing and it felt perfectly normal. So it's, it's really interesting to encounter stability factors that are beyond your experience and expectation. You learn to ski with what you have and a lot of times the ability to scrub or steer the ski with small inputs from your ankles makes a really big difference. So for me, the ski ability of a ski is really tied to what you're accustomed to and how you respond to challenges. And this is where the personalization of service really comes into play. In general, I find that Fisher wins at ski ability. It basically behaves predictably in any loading position, in any dynamic skiing style, and in almost all conditions, the exception being that boilerplate, hard pack, Grand Bournon situation where they're clearly at a disadvantage. Pretty much the rest of the time, they're super easy to ski and they're not real picky about who's on top of them. Solomon provides really top level edge security and directional stability if that's what you're looking for. But more than that, they provide tremendous predictability. Amy picks Solomon anytime she's a little nervous about conditions because when she pitches it downhill, she knows the ski is going to be right underfoot. It's going to hold whether she hits ice or slush and it's going to be predictable as she starts to step the corners on the downhills. And if she needs to push them sideways and slide them, she can do that. I struggle on Solomon's because with the knee injury, I have to be really high and forward. Otherwise, my knee kind of gets super sore. And in that position, I lose the benefit of the rear end tracking on this ski. I get too much load on the front and it starts to kind of windshield wiper. I, I lose the edge and, and the stability goes away. The Rossi, I think, when you're accustomed to this thickness profile, this S2 and S1 material set provides the highest absolute levels of edge stability and directional stability that you can get. And once you're accustomed to it, you're going to love it. I'm not accustomed to it yet, and it's difficult for me in challenging conditions because it's over the mark in terms of what I can handle. But clearly, there is a a really something there for people that that are accustomed to Rossi skis and many people when they get on these skis just feel like these are made for me they provide me everything i need in order to ski fast so it's it, it's a personal thing likewise the Matsu stuff for me they are almost the most enjoyable because they provide really good feedback ski ability directional control ability to scrub all the things i want in the position where i like to ski and need to ski. High and forward position tends to really be rewarded by the ski. I will say that the newest construction moves 
a good step toward Fisher's more universal approach. I don't think these are as picky as they have been in the past in terms of who's standing on them and how they're being skied. All of this contributes. When we put it all together, all of these things are in play, but they're all in balance. There's a cost to everything and you got to figure out what level you want, what ski ability factors contribute the most to your experience and how to get them.